Madam Chairman, I have one more question. Yes, Mr. Jones. Dr. Arroway, would you consider yourself a, uh, a spiritual person? Uh, I, I don't really understand the point of the question. Uh, I, I consider myself a moral person. I'm sure we all agree that is the case, but I think what Mr. Joss is in fact asking... Do you believe in God? As a scientist, I uh, rely on empirical evidence, and uh, in this matter, I, I don't believe that there is data either way. So your answer would in fact be that you don't believe in God? I mean, I think she quite clearly said not one side or the other, so I would consider that agnostic? and not necessarily not believe in God, but what do I know? I'm your host, Dr. Alex Swan, and today we are going to go to the stars. Today's film, we are going to talk Contact, the 1997 film about a scientist who made contact with extraterrestrial life. This is the classic science versus faith thematic movie. Late 90s, this was a hot thing. Also, 1997 came right after Independence Day. Well, let's ground Independence Day with slightly more science and slightly more gravitas, I suppose. Film was written by James Hart, Michael Goldenberg, and Carl Sagan. You can imagine that he wanted to get this one going. The film was directed by Robert Zemeckis, famous director, great filmography, just of direction, not just like producing and writing and everything like that. But of course, you're probably familiar with Zemeckis' work. Of course, Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump, of course, Contact, as we were talking about today, Cast Away, Polar Express, there's a little issue with that one. And then he was like, oh, let me do it again with Beowulf. <laughs> Not great. And then he's like, let me do it again with A Christmas Carol with Jim Carrey in it. He was really a big fan of this like lifelike CG movement. It didn't really work for me, though. Some of his more recent movies, Flight... Uh, Allied, Welcome to Marwin, and most recently, Pinocchio, the live action with Tom Hanks as Geppetto. Anyways, like, this is one of his solid, solid films. Well-directed, uh, great film. Uh, Well-regarded, too, of course, Contact. It's, it's a little on the lengthy side, though. It, it kind of draws out a little bit there were like two major stories that are occurring one of them being the detection of the extraterrestrial signal and then the trip that the main character ellie arroway uh takes to what is kind of best described as another dimension at least in my in my mind that's where she goes ellie arroway is played by jodie foster i think in one of my favorite roles of hers just because of how she has to grapple the faith versus science argument and i honestly don't think that is a good thematic argument anyways they're both interested in different 
questions. They're both, you can be a faith-based scientist. Like you can be a, a scientist who believes in the uh, the supernatural, God, uh, religious, spirituality, all of that stuff. You can be both at the same time. So she does a really good job, I think, uh, playing both sides of this really difficult question. The other big role in this movie is Matthew McConaughey as Palmer Joss. Uh, he gets on my nerves. He gets on my nerves sometimes, but I think in the end, he's a good character. Uh, Tom Skerritt has a big role. So does John Hurt. David Morse plays Ellie's father, Ted Arroway. William Fickner has a role. James Woods has a role. I mean, lots and lots of major people from the 90s and 2000s. Even Larry King shows up as himself. It's a good movie. I think it's a good movie. But in this episode, we are going to not focus, of course, on the aliens, because that is a job for exobiologists or astronomers. No, I think what this movie does a good job of is give the audience a look at science and what scientists do and how scientists come to conclusions. Of course, in a fairly compressed timeline as this movie is, they advance pretty quickly with the instructions from the extraterrestrials. Uh, so... You know, you have to kind of suspend your disbelief for that bit, but it does do a decent job in explaining the process. And when government gets involved, what does that mean for the science? And then, of course, when you have a situation of extraterrestrials potentially existing or actually existing, you run into the situation of, well, what does this mean for our earthly religions and the ideas that they have about our existence, uh, our being human existence and, and life on Earth and that kind of thing? So I think it does a pretty decent job at that. And that's what we're really going to focus on is um, the, the meta science, as it were. We'll also have a little bit of discussion of some of the site concepts that we pulled out of this particular movie. And so I think it's just going to be a good idea to just jump right in. So let's do it. Let's hit the button and go to another dimension. My guest host today is Dr. Jacob Miranda. Jacob is a recent graduate from the University of Alabama and is now in his second semester, ooh, first year, as an assistant professor at California State University, East Bay, go CSU system. He is, a pa he is passionate about the open science movement, the replication crisis, and improving the process of science. Jacob runs the Meta Scientific Investigation and Scientific Training Mist, well done, lab, which focuses on bringing underrepresented undergraduates into the world of research. Jacob, welcome to the show. I feel very welcome. I'm excited to be here. And thank you for that lovely introduction. I started with like the acronym first for like a like, name of and like trying to figure out like, all right, what words can fit into this that I actually do research on. <laughs> I love it. So well done. It's a process. Well, I'm happy that you're here and I'm happy that we're going to talk about the science of science. Um, and so but before we do that, I always like to ask my guests um, what their thoughts are on movies and film in general. And if you use media in your teaching, what kind of media and why? Sure. So I'm going to go with your uh, most recent question, since that's the ones on top of my head of using media within the classroom. Uh -huh. um, I try to, uh, particularly I use YouTube clips quite a bit, um, but also mm -hmm. things from like John Oliver or, so maybe to backtrack, currently I'm teaching like social psychology and methods. And so I just okay. feel like there's a lot of depictions of science within media or like science communication. Um, mm -hmm. Very similar. I think it just kind of resonates with students more. So I'm not sure. Okay. At least that's the media I've used. I haven't used movies quite a bit. So this has been an interesting experience. Yeah. And did you do any teaching in graduate school? Uh, yeah, uh, I was very fortunate. So I graduated from University of Alabama um, 
and they're very gracious with like teaching opportunities for grad students for those who want it, mm-hmm. but also, you know, give wiggle room for those who don't. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely was very teacher hungry and I think I taught like seven courses by the time I graduated. Um, nice. ironically enough, none of the courses I taught and prepped for back then am I teaching now. So I'm like, ah, well, all that work. That's the case in academia, right? Mm-hmm. So, so let's then go back to what are your thoughts on movies? What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you like? What do you dislike about movies in general? As a since I like movies generally at a personal level, just because of the nostalgia value. I was just like a big mm-hmm. movie kid. Like family had hundreds okay. of VHSs, thousands of DVDs. Um, and I don't know. Thousands of thousands DVDs. Thousands of DVDs. Wow. We had a whole theater room growing up. I was very privileged in that regard. My mom was. A wow. Big movie buff. So. I wish I had that. Damn. Yeah, no, if Advent of Netflix, that changed things. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, I don't know. Like that, that's typically what I associate with. But once I hit undergrad. I don't know. I just watch movies like a lot less. So now it's become uh-huh. more of like a treat um, to either uh-huh. go to a theater or like just watch a full length movie. And so, uh-huh. yeah, th- this is always I was like, oh, this is pleasant. This is cool. It does take a lot of time. It, it does take a lot of time. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I have a movie pass um, account and I can only see one movie a month, basically, with, you know, schedule and kids and doing all the housework and all of that kind of stuff. I ended up, I end up only getting like to go see some big thing, uh, once a month. And I wish I could see more, but of course we have all of the streaming things. So why not? Right. Why not? Before we get into contact though, I do have a question for you since you are a new professor. How's your first year going? Oh yeah. Baby professor status. Uh, mm-hmm. So y- you mentioned the institution I'm from. So Cal state university, um, which has kind of been on the news like this past month. Cause you know, strikes, uh-huh. historic striking. strikes. And whatnot. Went so, striking for a day. Went striking for a day that was planned for five. <laughs> so that was kind of anticlimactic. There was always like the expectation <laughs> of like, yay, we're going to. And it's like, oh, wait, it's, it's over. Um, so there was a lot of confusion. The, the way it was counted pretty early. Um, but I mean, beyond that, the students at like a CSU are different from like University of Alabama. Um, obviously, Absolutely. Like, yeah. I mean, like by the very, very age, right? Alabama students versus like California <laughs> students, uh, both like demographics, but also just we have like a lot of non-traditional students. So I think like the mm-hmm. average age of our students is like 26 or 27 years old. Um, wow. Okay. And so I don't know. It's been a treat because like I love teaching, but like when you go to like a 17 year old teenager in Alabama and you you try to talk about like racism or prejudice or discrimination, like that, that's one way to like have an engaging classroom. But like now imagine going to here to NorCal in the Bay Area. Right. Uh-huh. And you have a grandmother. Right. <laughs> and she's just like, let me tell you about this neighborhood. And like it, it's just a different dynamic. That's cooler. I, or I shouldn't say it. cooler. It's different, amazing. But, you know. I value it's it. It, it, it's quite yeah it's quite different right the demographics really do inform the conversations that you're gonna have for sure uh so give uh, because the csu is so big you did say bay area where in the bay area is east bay uh specifically hayward so apparently the campus used hayward. to be called csu hayward but mm-hmm. some beef of the city i don't know and we're like no we're east bay yeah, uh, I when I was at Cal State Northridge in Southern California, it was CSU Hayward somewhere around that time. Yeah, it got changed to East Bay. And I think another CSU campus got changed around that time, too. I don't remember exactly what. But yes, CSU pride over here. Uh, you will uh, you will um, you will always hear that from me. Uh, CSUN did a uh, did a lot for me. So I'm going to always going to have a special place in my heart for for that school and for that school system largest school system in the country whoop whoop (laughs) (laughs) somebody get a tv monitor all right pass the recording into the image processor you want the new data uh yeah the new frequency the one we just recorded hi david would you explain this to me please one with a prime there's another signal looks like a tv transmission we're hot all right do me a favor go get the blinds it has a lot of glare you're patched in. All right, it's definitely an image. Let's try and stabilize it. What do you make of that fish? It's almost like they're two different interlaced frames. They're framing one. Ah, it's just noise. Trying frame two. Ah, uh, I've got an offset carrier here. I think it's audio. Well, plug it in, plug it in. 
listen to that segment? Centering. Uh, can you clean it up anymore than that fish? I'm working on it. Zoom it out. I freeze. Reverse values. Uh, try zooming out again. Rotate 90 degrees counterclock. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, what's going on? Does anybody speak German? Uh, I, I declare the games in Berlin at, at the celebration of, of the first Olympics of the new era is open. All right, so let's move into contact. Okay, so uh, constant contact. Uh, contact. Robert Zemeckis film, Jodie Foster, Matthew McConaughey. And, and, I, and I should preface this by we met each other just like a previous uh, discussion, a previous episode. We met each other at the annual conference on teaching from the Society for the Teaching of Psychology back in October of last year or you know for those of you listening into the future october 2023 we met for the first time and uh through a mutual friend friend of the show and uh previous guest host jordan waggy and um we were talking about the podcast and you did you did explain that you weren't a, a big movie head e anymore and uh, but I, I did want you on the, the show because we we talked a lot over the over the course of the conference and you were open to suggestions. And of course, your mist lab talks about meta science. So I was had a little thought. I was like, well, what movies are out there that talk about that that are good for meta science? In other words, what movies show the process of science. And so I did a little bit of searching and I found contact. And this was your first time seeing contact? Very first time. Yeah. And so what did you think of it? I thought it was so interesting. Um, I, I was talking to you a little bit about this before we start recording, but like this is the first time, like when I do watch a movie, I said it's kind of for treats, like it's for entertainment, it's mm -hmm. recreational. Um, right. But like knowing it's like, OK, I'm going to be watching this movie, but I have to keep in mind, like, what are the psychological concepts? What can I like if I were a teacher? Like, what can I pull from this to then like talk to someone else about it? And right. and so like this like two and a half hour movie, I was like there for like four hours, just like pausing, thinking about it, writing down notes. Um, <laughs> I, I love it. Way too notes. But like so my first thoughts of contact was when it was a very different experience than I was used to media. Um, second okay. impression that immediately happened after that, uh, I was scared. Um, cause the movie starts out with like a silent 30 seconds and then it just blares the radio of like music at you, or at least maybe I had my headphones too. High. So I was like, I don't know what this movie is. What the heck is going on here? Um, but no, uh, very seriously, I think the movie's an interesting one because it has like so many different like philosophies of science or like different, different approaches or different ways or relationships someone can have with like the truth. And yeah. like, basically you have like all these different characters or there's like these like five casts that I try to keep track of. That every time mm -hmm. they talked, they were like, I don't want to say like they weren't three dimensional characters, but like what I heard were, were like for like philosophies from them rather than like seeing yeah. them as a character, if that makes sense. I was just like, what, what's being communicated to me through this mm -hmm. person at any point? So like that, that's what I was noticed. Yeah. Yeah. I know that makes sense. Um, and that I think is, yeah, to, uh, I, I don't think it would be kind to call it two dimensional characters, but they did represent uh, they were personifications of ideas for sure. Right. They were they were anthropomorphized ideas 
Um, and the conflicting ideas, of course, um, is when it comes down to it with the main conflicting pairs of ideas being science and faith represented by Arroway and um, Joss. Like, did you ever like take any like film classes on undergrad, like film critique? Or is this like, like the, the terms you use, like, I was like, I kind of want to be like a film critic major, like kind of go back, like if this is what they get to talk about and do. I was just wondering <laughs> if you like had experience beforehand or like you just started and it's like, just as you learn. I've had one film class in my life and that was a film history class. But no, I and but I lost. So I I watch uh, a lot of film analysis. Do you? Okay, then. then yes. Like, gotcha. And like, you kind of like just pick up like okay, and like yeah, it's a skill set. Like you you almost like picking up tools every time. Yeah, it's a vocabulary like, for yeah. sure. Yeah, um, being able to to pick that kind of stuff out. Yeah, it's my it's my second passion, of course, psychology being number one. But it's my it's my second passion. So I try to sound competent. You're very successful um, at yes, doing so, so. I, I do have a desire to get a film certificate, uh, a, a film studies certificate, but there are very few programs that offer certificates, and of course they're expensive. So if you could, though, um, that would be so maybe awesome. in the future. I, I, it's it's, it's still going a goal. To gotcha. I, I want it to happen. I'm going to will it to happen. Will we'll to see happen. what happens. Have faith. Yeah. <laughs> so let's jump into the discussion in our first segment here, which is going to be about your expertise here, which is meta science and or if for for folks who may not be familiar with this term, this is like the science of science. And when we use meta science in this context, we're talking about how um, science is done. Right. So the science of the scientific method, how scientists come to their conclusions, what those conclusions mean and all these kinds of all these kinds of things. Um, what what does it mean for an observation to be empirical? Is that was that actually empirical? Um, even ethics are involved in this. Of course, science is no good if you keep the knowledge to yourself. So peer review is part of it. And all of these things are represented in the movie. So, Jacob, for the listeners, what kind of work do you do with meta science? And then we can kind of explore some of these ideas um, as portrayed in the movie. Maybe a little bit about my background. Um, I was very fortunate to have a mentor um, whose name's Alexa Tullet. And Alexa happened to be a very big name, like in the open science movement. Um, okay. That was really in a response to psychology's replication crisis that started like around 2011. And so because my mentor was really big on that sp in that space, right? Um, a mm -hmm. lot of my training, like a lot of my background is really coming from that. If you think about psychology or if you think about medicines as putting the research under the microscope, those are the people we care about. And so what our lab did was we collect, we basically passed out surveys, both in person at conferences as well as like uh, journal listservs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and we essentially asked people to talk about their perceptions of the field. So basically asking mm -hmm. psychologists to reflect on their own work. Uh, some basic work that I do in the meta science sphere um, is try to study like two, basically two things. One is essentially how scientists are biased um, okay. and kind of really relevant to the film. Uh, I care a lot about confirmation bias and like the dimensions of uh -huh. that. Uh, and the second thing I do as far as like doing science on scientists is looking at big team science. Um, so okay. currently I'm in a large scale project where we're talking to people who run like those big teams, like psychological science accelerator, the many labs yeah. projects and right. saying, what is the best way for like, when you have hundreds of scientists working together, how do you organize and facilitate a project like that? So if that makes yeah. sense, confirmation bias, and then like the methods to do that big team science. Right. And I think um, that especially uh, confirmation bias, we'll talk about confirmation bias a little bit more in the second segment. Uh, but for that second one, right, big team science. So the movie is and the big blaring that you hear at the beginning of the movie is, of course, the golden record on Voyager. Right. With all a bunch of different recordings from the 1970s blast that out into space and as long as voyager has power it is broadcasting that as a radio signal and so our main character arroway dr ellie arroway i believe right 
Mm -hmm. Ellie. Uh, which is a great name because that's my daughter's name. Oh. Um, she works for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which had a had a, a, a kind of a decade in the 90s, right? Because SETI is also featured in Independence Day uh, because they're the ones who first intercept the signal from the aliens that are coming coming to attack us. Luckily, these are benevolent creatures, uh, whatever they are. We never actually see what they are because this is a human story, not a an alien story. Uh, so Ellie works for SETI, and that oh, <laughs> if we want to talk about massive collaborations, SETI is a is a lab of massive collaborations because not only is it in the desert in New Mexico, um, but it's, it's many labs at various universities, even all around the world, not just the United States, but all around the world get SETI data from all of those big ass uh, radio dishes. Right? So what I think might be a fun thing to do as a, a little exercise, Jacob is taking that work at SETI and comparing it to your your work in meta science, and if there are any parallels that you saw in the movie about coordinating all of these scientists. As I'm reflecting on the movie, I'm trying to think about the piece when it did come to like that global or international collaboration. I felt mm -hmm. like that was that the the way that they framed it was very minor. Um, they almost felt like it was a given that like a network comes together. They often talk about like 150 labs across mm -hmm. the globe coming together. Um, and at least within psychology, I feel like that's like not the norm. It's just, you don't have 150 <laughs> labs all the time, always coordinating with one another. I feel like that's just a very recent trend um, within the past decade. So yeah. and like within the physics realm, right? So that scientific discipline that is, you know, everyone uses the Hubble telescope. Everyone uses like these kind of like, same metrics and they collaborate mm. and work together uh for us not necessarily as much but i think we're getting better yeah. at that so like we're we're trying to identify like these big projects in this psa organization and say does this have global relevance is this something that we can say generalizes to like most humans not just like the weird yeah. samples right and so like i think we're getting better at that or at least we're trying to figure out how to do that well Right. And I think if you go back to the 2011 um, paper that really shone a light on the lack of replication that was occurring, imagine if we had what, like you say, physics and astronomy have, like being able to have all of this data and then share it because it's part of some global network. You're right. Psychology doesn't have that global network, but we're starting with it. Right. So the open science movement um, kind of the name for it kind of stems from one of the first uh, organizations on uh, the field, which was the Open Science Framework, right? Yeah, very definitely. Because um, I think the paper you're referencing is like the OSC, the Open Science Collaboration, that 2015 paper. Because mm -hmm. like I know like in 2011, like that's when like psychics are real from, you know, Daryl Bem or like fraudsters yeah. from yeah, that's true. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, during that paper basically said a third of psychologies, like we looked at the top 100 studies, mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say top, but we looked at like the most cited studies, the top 100 most cited studies within three journals. And like mm -hmm. these are like the big name famous journals. And to find that we had like a replication rate, which again, a replication, it's if you say you found an effect once and someone did the exact same study, can you find it again? Or even like close to it, right? It doesn't even have right. to be in the close same size. It. Right. Can you do that? And it was like 36 percent. And that was like a yeah. higher that was a higher estimate. And it's like, oh, yeah, Lord. that was a higher estimate. I share when I when that first came out, I shared it with um, an experimental site class. And I was just like, look, look, guys, this is this is not great. And we're we're here as uh, teaching them the scientific method. Right. And this is Ellie's character's whole life is this scientific method. And she doesn't get an opportunity as as the uh, personified scientific method. She doesn't get a chance to uh, reckon with that in the same way a scientist actually would, which is just over a long period of time. And um, whether am I doing this right or am I not doing this right? She kind of has to do it all at once. 
No, I, I would agree, because I feel like Ellie, she almost reflects like a pure view of the scientific method, right? Like the mm-hmm. whole point of getting that true foreknowledge is because it's true and, you know, we need pauperianism and falsification and measuring things. But like anytime it comes to like politics, she'll actively say like, oh, Paul, like, you know, when the Hitler video went out and she's like, no, 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 this isn't a political thing. Or when the NSA said, like, hey, this is a national security threat, she's like, no, the globe can work together and we can all collaborate. It's very mm-hmm. interesting to kind of like see like just like this love of science or like this idealistic view, this pure view of science happening. Yeah. But I do appreciate in the movie, though, that um, she explains for the audience how an organization like SETI works and uh, to politicians, because politicians don't know how these these global uh, f- evidence based fact finding organizations work. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a, a quote I liked where there was like, I think, a conservative senator. And he's okay. like, I don't care if they're aliens. I want to know if like they believe in God or something along the lines of like, but do they believe in God, though? And so like <laughs> and her trying to like interact with that. And she's like, or if there was a second, she's like, but do, why, why aren't they talking to us in English? Um, mm-hmm. And she just like stared at them. And she's like, well, mm-hmm. 70% of humans don't speak. Or like, it was just like a very like ethnocentric, like, oh, like, yeah, absolutely. A politician. I believe it was the politician. And she's just like, what do I do about this? Yeah, I mean, and that's part of a scientist's job is to communicate. You you mentioned science communication a little bit earlier. And of course, this podcast is is literal science communication, of course. Um, fun science communication, if I do say so myself. Um, but we do have to communicate properly these effects and uh, and and these uh, observed phenomena. But you know, sometimes we're not good at it. Sometimes we don't really know the best way to approach something. If you end up with somebody who is a character, of course, uh, saying like, "Why aren't they speaking English to us?" Like how you it, it's very hard to meet somebody at that level when they're when they're so far away. Right. The 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 prevailing wisdom in when you're having these kinds of conversations, especially the main thematic uh, uh, interplay between the the between the two characters, between the two ideas is faith versus science. Right. And when you're so far apart. The prevailing wisdom is like find common ground. But when somebody asks, why aren't they why aren't these aliens speaking English to us? Where (laughs) you're so far apart, you can't find that common ground. It's like you are on opposite ends of the globe here, sir. It might turn out to be some kind of a transport. Now. Our internal numbers show support for this is incredibly soft. So if the president wishes to stay this course, I can guarantee you, you're going to find his numbers going south like a duck in winter. I, this is nuts. Excuse me, miss. We know nothing of these creatures' values. The fact of the matter is, we don't even know whether they believe in God. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you were going to ask... Excuse me, Dr. Arroway. We won't be suppressing any opinions here today. Uh, no, of course not. I understand. Um, what I meant to say is that the message was written in the language of science. Now, if it had been religious in nature, it should have taken on the form of a burning bush or a big booming voice from the sky. But a voice from the sky is exactly what you found, Dr. Arroway. Yeah, it, it almost feels impossible, right? I, I, and I, I do think it is possible, but I can like understand the exasperation as well of like, like for you have to like at least have some like where do you start to build that common ground? You're like with this person who completely just said something that would never ever cross my mind. Like where can we begin to start at least talking to one yeah. another? Right. Um, it is weird because as you we were like talking about the importance of science communication, and even this podcast, it feels weird. Like no, at least not within psychology. Like no PhD programs like have a scientific or like a media communications course as part of like the doctoral training. Like. Like if knowledge oh, is communicated us, to like the public, like they don't even teach us how to teach. So I mean, oh well, yeah, that's true. I mean, yes, in this podcast, you're like, this is what, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I was just like, what about me teaching? It's like, 
<laughs> I mean, I, I don't I don't disagree. I think, um, you know, we can walk and chew bubble gum. But um, yeah, it's pretty much just research, 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 hammering that home in most doctoral programs. I, I don't want to say all. I think my doctoral program at the University of California, Santa Barbara was um, decent in allowing students to take the teaching path, even though, you know, everyone there was still like, you know, you got to you got you still got to work on your research. But there was still a, there was a little bit more some other programs no of course they're 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 research 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 and if you don't know how to explain it to your grandmother or you can't readily make uh the you know the elevator pitch then you're gonna kind of flounder you're gonna be at the mercy of the journal to journalism cycle and that's always bad because the evening the you know the seven o'clock evening news in your home in your hometown isn't going to represent your research well without your input so I think that's what the movie does a really good job of. So Ellie's the one who makes this discovery uh, of the message from the extraterrestrials. Pages and pages of data. Over 63,000 in all. And on the perimeter of each... Alignment symbols, uh, registration mark, but they don't line up. They do. If you think like a vegan. An alien intelligence is going to be more advanced, and that means efficiency functioning on multiple levels and in multiple dimensions. Yes, of course. Where's the primer? You see, every three-dimensional page contains a piece of the primer. There it was all the time, staring you in the Buried within the message itself is the key to decoding it. Within the layering of the matrix, we have these basic equations. Like the billionaire or trillionaire or whatever he was, like the random philanthropist <laughs> that just randomly came. He felt kind of almost like a ghost machine for the story. He's like, oh yeah, actually, absolutely. I found, or I thought he was the one that found the pattern. Like he's like, here's our three D thing, and he did the whole diagram. And like I said, this is oh, probably yeah, not sure, relevant sure. to the podcast. But I was just like wondering, sure. just like I, I, that's the only character I don't know the significance of. So maybe this is something after the podcast I could talk to you about. But like that was just something I was just like really curious. I'm just like, I mean, I get the little he's like in the sky above everyone. Then he's in space, very above anyone. Now he's in he- like, I, like I get that, but like yeah, I just don't know like if he's like the chaotic funder or I'm getting ahead probably, of myself. But like the whole funding process the, was like yeah, yelling a bunch of judges be watched from a camera. I was like, is this how funny could work? Maybe I should, we should change our, our I don't think, system. I don't think so. I don't think that's how funding works. Um, you could have an, I mean, movies are just great with, there's an amazing imaginary or not imaginary, but like this amazing angel, uh, benefactor. Right. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, the idea here is that this wasn't a collaboration for figuring out that this was a device to build this or the the message was instructions for this uh, a device to build right and um ellie takes like complete ownership of it when uh there's pushback on whether she should be the one to go uh in the uh device which turns out to be like a spaceship uh just for all intents and purposes we'll call it a spaceship and she wants she wants to go. And people are like, well, you're not an astronaut. All right, yeah, so that, 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 that is weird. Um, I was going to ask you your thoughts on, for the science communication piece, this supervisor, I forget his name. I just call him like the, the, the ass, basically the jerk, I should say, and not this <laughs> on here, the jerk. Um, but like, he essentially like scoops her. And so like, when it comes oh, to yeah. like, at least the public face of science communication, right? Like, just, you know, this is my discovery. I love the team, right? Even though there's a history of, like, not supporting it. Of Yeah. I think there's going to be... Uh, so, this is the 1990s, right? So, I think now it's different because people can go on social media and be like, this is my discovery, right? But in the 90s, and you work for an organization, if you are not the top echelon of that organization, then you could absolutely scoop somebody or just get the credit for it. Of course, they there had to be a foil for Ellie that wasn't just that wasn't just Joss 
Palmer Joss going, oh, what about God? And do you believe in God? You know, there had to be some additional foil. And of course, 90s were really the 90s movies and media were really good at the misogynistic sexism angle. And that um, I think there was a purpose. There was a reason why they made the main character a woman in this. Uh, Carl Sagan was credited as a writer here. And this was only a few years after Demon Haunted World came out. His book, uh, Demon Haunted World, came out. So. He was in this mindset of I need to compare uh, this belief in the supernatural and religion and science. And I want I'm going to go back and forth and we're going to pit the two against each other because he saw a dangerous and I, I, I urge anyone to if you haven't read a demon haunted world to go read that and how prescient it is 30 years later in, in what is happening in society now and the the anti-intellectualism that runs deep in our culture um, and the anti-science movements that we're seeing all over the place. And lest this becomes a a uh, odd <laughs> an odd reference that makes no sense in the future. The Alabama Supreme Court saying uh, embryos in IVF are humans is just is wild to me that you have people making decisions that um, don't understand science and um, litigate that idea to all the lives in a state or a country. So. I think Carl Sagan was trying to say something with this movie. <laughs> he had the message and then he used and then he had help from screenwriters to put that message on paper. Um, no, definitely with the um, what's going on with IVF in the Alabama Supreme Court. I think it's uh, e even more scarier that the rationale wasn't. It was explicitly rooted within like scripture. And it's like what we're doing yeah. here is because of the Bible, because this reflects our constituency. And that, that mm -hmm. kind of feels scary, right? Because like yeah. when it comes to like when is a human a human? Like that's like one of those like big questions. And mm -hmm. I, a, I a don't big know. Question, yeah, like, I think a, I think a question that you'll likely get. Two different answers, one from science, one from faith, but you you can't mix the two together. As I said in the introduction, um, it's it's kind of unfair to for Carl Sagan, of course, and for other people who have agendas to pit science against faith because they are asking different questions. They're always going to ask different questions and they're always going to arrive at different answers. In, in completely different processes from question to answer. And th the movie does a really good job of setting the stakes of this by never showing the aliens. It's incredibly important that there is no Independence Day weird kind of multi tentacle thing or even humanoid aliens that have like big heads and long skinny arms and legs and stuff like that. Or even the short ones that you see in Mars Attacks, which is criminally underrated. But in any case, I will say that um, when I think of this movie and I think of the pit of science versus um faith i'm always like this is a false dichotomy and people don't need to pick a side unless it's going to start involving other people and that's where you get the alabama thing but i don't want to date this i don't want to uh, date this episode <laughs> no there's <laughs> not trust me there's constant things going on in the news but yeah, that's yeah this true. might just very specifically the, just replace alabama uh, ivf Supreme Court with whatever thing is going on right now that's faith versus science. Um, so speaking of um, Ellie taking ownership of this, uh, we'll call it her baby. We'll, we'll call it her baby. Um, just like researchers have their thing and they call it their babies, right? Um, she takes ownership of this. But as a scientist, she needs to get, engage in peer review. Because if you don't engage in peer review, you have pseudoscience, right? Right. 
Um, I mean, I think the first time they even hear the signal, like they confirm it, and like as like this, her her and her team automatically start talking about like alternative explanations besides right, like that. That's part of the science process. It's she might have have like she might have this idea of like here's the result. I hope it is, but being a good skeptic and working for a team, it's like this is a star system that is too new. It's X, it's Y, it's C. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I thought that was a good portrayal of science. Um, obviously there is a lot of like motivated reasoning, but like that initial thing of like, let's look for any other explanation. Um, mm-hmm. I thought was pretty good. And that's the peer review process, right? That's uh, the, the reviewers are supposed to uh, pick apart your narrative as the researcher uh, to just say, could this be explained in another way? So we have the initial peer review, like you said, um, with her team. But of course, peer review in real life happens um, with, generally speaking, other experts in the field, right? So if this were done properly in the movie, of course, condensed timeline, they'd have to publish a paper. That paper would then go out to expert reviewers. Most of the time, those are anonymous to the writer of the paper. And... um, get they'd have to have access to the data of course they'd have to have access to the audio file files uh and then give their explanation or give their green light and be like oh my god this is an amazing discovery but all of that happens generally speaking on in like in in the margins right most people are continuing on with their day-to-day work while they're waiting for peers to come back uh, what's the longest you've waited for uh, a review to come back, Jacob? Oof, maybe close to half a year. Not quite, but I think like five and a half months. And I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about this. Um, <laughs> it had been that long. I was like, oh, shit. Oh, whoa. Yeah, I've I've waited for six months. I've been uh, an author waiting around six months for a decision, right? Of course, this kind of finding cannot rest on six months, right? You're just like twiddling your thumbs waiting for people to be like, "Are th- is this good? So we end up with an accelerated timeline. It goes up to, of course, the upper echelons of the government. The government, like you said, somebody thinks it's a national security threat and all of that. And we go down into the drama paths. But then there's another peer review at the end of the movie. Uh, when she returns from her trip, uh, her trip to some place, I think it's another dimension. In in my mind, it's another dimension. I mean, she could be traveling across time and space. I, I don't know, but because we don't see a lot, um, it's hard to tell. So I think it's another dimension um, that we just don't have ways of accessing with our current understanding of of the universe. And so she has to sit with questions at the end, right? So how does that how does that peer review, that public peer review process uh, shake out? Yeah, as you were talking, um, I, I think that what you're really capturing with this peer review is this idea of like organized skepticism, right? Yeah. Um, and I often think of, I believe it's like a Harvard um, science historian, Naomi Oreskes, I believe is her last name, where she's like very famous on talking about like, in order to do science well, you have to recognize that scientists are human that we're a community of people and that although individually we're biased as a group, if we have this organized skepticism, right, this group peer review, like that's how we can slowly get closer to the truth. Okay. Um, it really is interesting, at least in this movie, how this peer review plays out as almost like a downside or like almost a limitation to get at something greater because mm-hmm. at least for her, as she's talking about her experience, right. Uh, going through the wormhole or to a different dimension, um, the peer review folks are saying, you know, are you psychotic? Are you basically like, were you on drugs? Did you have a hallucination? Were you? Which again, she freely admits, like, those are all possibilities. Um, and so, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's the interesting the way that the film is almost saying, like, because of the, sci- the scientific process, they're now like limited in believing this like truth right her truth that there that she did meet extraterrestrial life even though we never quite saw who who or what they were mm-hmm. um but i also don't think that's necessarily like a bad thing right it's the if there are alternative explanations 
I think it's fine for them to be skeptical, right? Even though they, the movie kind of portrays it as a bad thing, I think that's how science can and should work. Um, right. And, and I think it it gets back to what you were saying just a little while ago with the psychology replication crisis, right? So we have an N of one in the movie. Her experience, right? And so I think everyone at the end is justifiably skeptical, right? Because there are also, there are all so um, convicted with their belief systems. Um, and, and and most importantly, of course, uh, Matthew McConaughey's Palmer Joss, who um, believes so much in God due to a, um, a near-death experience that he is willing to ignore Ellie's convictions about what she experienced. Shoot, send him through the thing. Like, send him through and 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 maybe it'll change. Or maybe it will just uh, reinforce his belief in God because he will perceive that uh, experience as similar to his near-death experience where instead of going to space and meeting aliens... He is going to heaven and meeting God. Yeah, the, the parallels were like, I feel like the movie was sometimes a little too on the nose with the themes I was trying to communicate. <laughs> right? Of course, like, it's a very, movie. very. It was. I was like, it, it felt cheesy. I'm like, okay, this is a '90s movie. When they'll directly say, "Wow, you need faith, don't you?" And she's like, uh, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, scientists, I guess, have faith. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got distracted with myself. Remind me of what you just said. And I, I, I had like a response and then I got distracted. I was like, Yeah, so it, it, he, he Yeah. He um, you know, it, it it's all based on the perception of the experience. So even if we were to shove Palmer into the uh spaceship or whatever, and he goes to this new place the the same way Ellie did, it, it's not him meeting it's not him meeting uh, aliens. It's him meeting God. Sure. It, it's meeting something that's greater than yourself. If that's like, again, little green men as like the film, like kind of self jokes about, or if it's this higher deity, but like this almost like advanced intelligence, right? One says God, the other says aliens, tomato, tomato, at least in this film, um, yes. or at least that's what the film really tries to portray. It's, you know, we all, the, the film, it's like, I think central thesis is like within human nature, we're all driven to like, look for the profound in life. And mm -hmm. again, if that's God or aliens, right. It, it doesn't necessarily, it's a bad thing. It just says you have to have faith in something, anything in that regard. Um, which, how do you feel about like, cause it, the film really tried to say like, these two aren't as different, but like in your head, do you like make this like, very, oh, like, I clear? Like, like, do you agree with the film's central thesis of like, there's strong parallels or like, was there? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, there are strong parallels between belief systems. Um, but like I said, when we first started talking about this, um, they, are at, they can ask the same question. They will arrive at different answers. And the process to go from question to answer are completely different. But the, the film Central Thesis is, uh, again, from uh, astronomer Carl Sagan, who is probably one of the best science communicators that we've we've had um as a as a society as a culture at least in 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 western culture um and so i don't think he's uh, missing the mark at all there because we are all we're all bound and and constrained by our own belief systems and we have no conception of what extraterrestrial life could possibly be of course we we think they're all humanoid but there's there's no guarantee for that um there's no guarantee that there is other life out there uh it stands to reason that there is just just by the infinitude of 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 the universe for sure but at the same time somebody who is deeply deeply uh, subsumed within their faith in God is going to see that not as a knock against God, but rather a part of God. 
if that makes sense, right? That that's part of the divine plan. And I want to go back to what you just what you said about we are constantly looking for the profound. I think it is more or less a gradient toward the profound. Not everyone's always looking for the profound right off the bat. It's more question. It's more or less. Um, well, why? Okay. You give me an explanation. Okay, well, why about why on that explanation? So you have to give a little bit more explanation. And eventually, you reach the point of where it's just like, well, I don't know. It's just because. And what is the just because? And that's where the prof- the the profoundness exists is in the just because. Well, what is that? And have toddlers because they'll ask you why until you turn blue, and then you eventually say just because. That's the way it is. That's you. That's that's nature. No, I like that. And as you were talking, I was thinking about like a two year old saying like, why, why, why? So I think that you having toddlers, you're like, you probably actually do hear why, why, why quite a bit. Um, so, well, not anymore. Luckily, they're no they're no longer toddlers, but they still ask why questions. And if you don't have a good explanation, then you you're going to get asked why more or. If you do have a good explanation, you're going to ask why even more, right? You mentioned Karl Popper uh, a little while ago, and um, and uh, he's famous uh, in the 1950s when his book came out, um, I think somewhere around there. And he's he's obviously famous for this idea of falsification. And I think uh, and, and this is contrasted with uh, confirmation bias. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But. Um, Karl Popper is famous for falsification, and if you are going to do science properly, then you need to come at it from falsifying it, because we can just say things are things, and this is the way they are, this is what the cause is, and this is what the effect is, because I see it to be that case, but do other people see it to be that way? Because we are all just living in some kind of reality-adjacent reality. All of our all of our realities are subjective and we just have to agree that this is the way things are. Right. I mean, that encapsulates the idea of like naive realism. Right. We, we all yeah. kind of think that we we do it well enough where like we can all navigate the world. But there's never that guarantee that, you know, the red you see or the red I see or that we can even see red or not. Or like the, the most fundamental things of human experience. Right. Sight, smell, the, the fact that everything gets processed through the brain. And the fact that we can still like inch towards truth or at least collaborate and work together and try to like find like what can be objectively like that capital T truth that Popper mm-hmm. loved. Like, uh, yeah. So as you were talking, I feel like as you were talking, I'm like listening to you more as like a podcast listener. And I'm like, wow, this is really so fun. I'm like, wait, I should probably be like <laughs> thinking about as a, co- again, as a conversation of like, what should I respond to this? So like every time you talk, I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I'm like, what do I say now type of deal? So. I apologize. Um, no, I no, I, no, you're when good. When I do I, interrupt you, you like you have a face. You're like, "Damn it!" He's talking. I'm like, "I'm sorry. I'm probably <laughs> ruining the recording." I'm like, "I'm sorry." Uh, I, you know, I appreciate that actually, because um, most of the time, I, I, I speak, uh, in in a pontificating kind of of way, and I'm I don't know if I make a lot of sense when I do. I'm I'm very passionate about um, falsification and and that kind of stuff. So I I do enjoy it and enjoy talking about why it's important. But I also enjoy talking about why we live in in um, why objective objective reality is something we have created. It's a human creation. It's not necessarily true uh from that point and and people who are fully faith based in their thinking and that's where they get their all of their knowledge in a faith based way do have a good argument when they say well you know it's just what you think yeah okay i'm doing it i'm trying to be super objective about it as a scientist but you know touche Okay, so what I want to do is take a quick break and then we will come back and jump into some other psych concepts. First and foremost, confirmation bias, because that's the opposite of falsification right there. So stay tuned. We'll be back with Dr. Jacob Miranda. (music) 
Are you a big fan of the Cinema Psych podcast? A connoisseur of the compelling stories and intriguing insights that we have on this show? Well, show your love in style with our premium podcast merchandise. Yeah, that's right. I've updated the podcast store from ultra comfy hoodies, perfect for cozy podcast binges, to sleek coffee mugs that add a dash of personality to your morning routine. Our merchandise store has it all. I've added so many new products and it's designed to withstand countless listening marathons. There are a lot of episodes. I think you'll love them. But wait, there is more. Every week, there is a new promotion, turning up the volume on value. So keep an eye out for our exciting special promotions. Every other week, 15% off in between. Sometimes there's a special 25% off day. And then sometimes there's free shipping. It's the perfect way to score your Cinema Psych podcast merch for less. I'm excited to have expanded the merchandise offerings, but I'm really excited to say that new designs are coming up. And you can put these designs on all of the merchandise. So keep an eye out for new arrivals in the design section. So don't just listen, wear it, flaunt it, live it. Visit our merchandise store at cinemapsychpod.com dot swansike.com slash store to shop your love for the cinema psych podcast today remember every purchase goes directly to supporting this show and of course thanks for listening to this show i love doing it now let's get back into it I read your book. Here we go. Would you like me to quote you? Ironically, uh, the thing that people are the most hungry for, meaning, is the one thing that science hasn't been able to give them. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Come on. It's like you're saying that science killed God. What if, what if science simply revealed that he never existed in the first place? I think we're going to need to get some air. What? And a few more of these. Thank you. You're welcome. Ooh, a little chilly out here. Yeah, this is nice. I got one for you. What do you got? Occam's Razor. You've ever heard of it? Uh, Occam's Razor? It sounds like some slasher movie. No, Occam's Razor. It's a basic scientific principle. And it says, all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. Makes sense to me. All right. So what's more likely? Thank you. You're welcome. An all-powerful, mysterious god created the universe and then decided not to give any proof of his existence, or that he simply doesn't exist at all, and that we created him so we wouldn't have to feel so small and alone. I don't know. I couldn't imagine living in a world where God didn't exist. You know, I wouldn't want to. How do you know you're not deluding yourself? <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I need proof. Proof. Did you love your father? What? Your dad, did you love him? Yes, very much. Prove it. And we are back with Dr. Jacob Miranda. Tuck in Contact, 1997, Robert Zemeckis film about... Hearing aliens after they hear us and then going and seeing them, but only one person does. Ellie Arroway, played by Jodie Foster, uh, and her foil, somewhat. Kind of a friend-foe kind of dynamic they have. Palmer Joss, played by Matthew McConaughey. So in this segment, uh, as I said at the end of the last segment, we are interested in the opposite of falsification and this kind of directive that exists in modern science disciplines. And it's not just psychology. 
it's not just physics. It's not just chemistry. Falsification is like the main philosophy for scientific discovery. And it is meant to counteract a bias that is fairly pervasive uh, in all of our lives. I mean, there's, there's no getting around it. One good strategy that I think um, helps, if you're not a scientist, of course, is to pause and reflect if you find yourself engaging in this. Uh, and that's confirmation bias. This bias is is everywhere, and it it feeds us. It 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 keeps us going, right? It's the it's the lifeblood of of a cognitive. Seamless cognitive experience, I'll say. Um, and it feeds other biases as well. And uh, it is fairly fundamental to our cognitive architecture uh, when it comes down to it. We want to live in a world that makes sense. And the only way that it makes sense is if the information that we encounter in the environment feeds that sense. Um, that that reasonableness and we ignore information or actively reject that information when it doesn't feed that sense. So, Jacob, uh, where is the confirmation bias in this movie? And hint, it's it's Ellie, right? Uh, a little bit, Ellie. You know, I, I kind of picked <laughs> up what they were putting down there. Um, mm -hmm. Ellie's an interesting character because, again, this idea of like really personifying this idea this ideal pure version of science, pauperian science. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as a character, what seems to drive like a lot of her actions is again, the point of the movie is like, how do we find meaning in life? And like her meaning of finding something greater than her seems to be really tied down to like when her father died, her mother died even younger when she was like younger than nine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't sure. Like maybe the first instance I thought of like confirmation bias is the fact that she is sticking with this project when everyone is telling her, like, this is not worth your time. Yeah. And so, like, I, I wonder that if the signal, right, the signal that she caught um, that validated her beliefs, like, if that never happened in an alternative universe, I feel like her as a character, like, she wouldn't have stopped, right? And even if, like, she went through her whole scientific career and never found a signal and retired, mm -hmm. I still think in her head she would still believe, I already know this to be true. I just kind of need to find the data. To like yeah. back that up, like that, the because if you think about like confirmation bias as like two forms, like one big piece of it is information seeking, right? We look for information yeah. that tries to support our pre-existing beliefs, and Absolutely. I feel like that, like just her persistence with that against like the incentive structure against everything, really isn't like about finding the truth per se. It's about her needing to find something her father believed in, so, something to give her meaning in that regard. If that makes sense. Yeah, I do. I, I, I. Uh... I agree with you 100%. Uh, and and it, it, it really boils down to the behaviors that she engaged in, right? Um, and, and, and you alluded to this earlier, too, when we were talking about peer review and her team coming up with other explanations. She's like, no, 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 no. This, it, it's it's got to be this. It's got to be this. It, it's this. I, I, I feel it in my bones, basically. Um, that's that's confirmation bias and she is someone you would think would be more appreciative of this possibility as a scientist because we're all trained to spot it but just because we don't we try not to do it in our professional lives doesn't mean it's constantly happening in our personal lives too yeah, I mean, you're you're talking about the bias blind spot, right? Which is just like mm -hmm. this idea that psychoeducation, like learning about these biases makes it like very easy for us to identify the bias in others. But like, I mean, article after article shows that like, just because you learn more about the bias, you still really don't detect it. Or like, it's always like relatively lower than everybody else's. We, we think that we have some sort of insight that like, it's not um, biasing us. And then like, there's the flip side of like, when we do detect bias, we then overcorrect and are biased the other way. So it's like, the fact that it says like scientists are human first and humans are all have this blind spot. Uh, it, it makes me think of a paper done by like one of my brilliant colleagues. Her name's like Dr. Cassie Witt. 
And she like investigated, like, even when you're an expert, like you're a social psychologist and your PhD, your line of research is in biases. And like you give an assessment of like, do you still? First of all, how dare you? Uh, social psychologists don't get bias expertise. No, I'm kidding. No, I, yeah, I would argue like this and the bias experts. I mean, in her paper, that's what she found. It's like are biased, like they're just as biased as anybody else. Even oh, yeah, absolutely. They feel, but they'll state that they are, that they're relatively lower. And I think that's like really. Oh, no, like, this I, is am, just a, I am. I am. <laughs> I, feel a, like I own it. I'm humble. I, I don't know what I don't know. I love it. I in 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 my bias um video series, my lecture series, I, every episode I'm like I believe me. I I'm as biased as you guys just because I know this stuff and I've studied it for years doesn't mean I'm any less susceptible to any of it. But I will say that knowing is part of the battle recognizing and then understanding how they come about is really helpful in attempting to reduce them in your life. Some people take it. Some people might take it to the extreme and say, well, <laughs> I learned from Dr. Swan that uh, confirmation bias is found in this way. And, and so I don't do that at all. You're, you're, you're bullshitting. Um, if, if you're, if you're saying that to people, I mean, absolutely. I you're, you're fooling yourself, right? Like that is confirmation and uh, bias in its nutshell. It's like, I'm not as biased <laughs> as other people and you're only going to find information that supports how unbiased you are. And so mm -hmm. see, look at me, look how great I am. Look, at, it's like, we make mistakes. And I think that's like, that's when you were talking about peer review earlier. Like that's the point of peer review. Like yeah, just relying absolutely. on one person to say, this is what's true is ridiculous. Or in my view is ridiculous. Ignoring Ellie for for a minute and going to Joss Palmer or excuse me, Palmer Joss, uh, Matthew McConaughey. He is also just rife with confirmation bias because he sees everything through the um, spiritual lens. His pre-existing belief is the idea that there is something greater. And like he goes so far out of his way to I don't say sabotage Ellie, but like. When he gets the selective, she gets to go on the teleporter in the, in the first round. Because she doesn't agree, or I don't want to say agree with him, but doesn't reflect his views. He's going out of his way to even sabotage someone else because they don't agree with his views. Um, or maybe, again, maybe sabotage is too diabolical, but like that felt like a little, like he said, like, no, it was for your benefit. But like that felt yeah. like a very malicious, 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 I can't talk, selfish. Well, even when she's getting even when she's getting questioned um, and he essentially puts her on the spot and says, um, are you a spiritual person? And she's doesn't really know how to answer that. Um, I, I think I I think that's a, a decent example of confirmation bias because he's looking for her to feed his own agenda. He jumps in and says, are, you know, are you spiritual? And then and then she waffles on that question a little bit. And he's just like, do you believe in God? And she's, well, there's no evidence on either side. And then the other person jumps in and it's like, well, you, you, I guess it sounds like you're atheist. And she's and I'm like, oh, are you uh, are you listening <laughs> to the same thing I am? That in and of itself, I think, is confirmation bias. Just somebody saying, well, I don't know either way to make a determination does not mean that they don't believe in God or that they do believe in God. They're just they just don't have a position. And that's OK. We have a word for that. It's agnostic and it's fine. You don't have to. People who say there is no God are atheists. That is not the same thing as agnostic. But so I, I think that's a good example of confirmation bias. Even if it's not them saying something about themselves in the moment or doing something in the moment for themselves, um, playing against other people is absolutely confirmation bias. Because you are he already knew the answer to that question. And she answered in a diplomatic way. Of course, well, there's no evidence on either side, but there was a reason why he went from "Are you a spiritual person?" or to "Do you believe in God?" Because let's let's also um, let's also not be afraid to say 
um, the Abrahamic religions and their view of this monotheistic God is the only kind of spirituality or religiosity in the world. At least what I took from Palmer, I didn't see Palmer, at least like when I was, this was my interpretation, but like now I'm like reflecting, like, did I get this wrong? Like Palmer felt like much more trying to find like the middle ground between like, because I feel like the religious zealot, right? Like the one that was like, Die Hard was that the unnamed character that blew himself up, right? Like I felt like yeah. that was the portrayal of like religion being to the extreme and very stagnant. That, that's not what I'm. That's not what I'm trying to to say. What I'm trying to say is that um, Palmer, while he seems like he represents the middle ground, you can't necessarily. There's not a middle ground between science and 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 faith. There isn't a middle ground. You can be both. But right. it doesn't mean that you you inhabit this interstitial space between these two ideas. No, you're just in both bins. You consider yourself a person of faith and a scientist. And then you can be a person of faith or a scientist. Or you can be neither. And, and, and so while it may seem like he was trying to be like this ambivalent figure and and all of that i i I really think that he was more so and and he explains it in when he when he you know he meets ellie and he tells and he talks about his near-death experience uh and how it renewed his his faith and everything like that so i think that everything he does after that is indicative of his confirmation bias yeah that's interesting because i maybe i took the film at more face value with that (laughs) <laughs> because it, it seemed like, because when, when we talk, I, I, well, first, completely we agree with you that it's a false dichotomy or like putting religion and science at opposing ends to me is always like very silly. I mean, if there's mm-hmm. a history of it, right? Like when we look at the history of sex, like scientists making pacts to take out religion or like religious folks sabotaging, like there's a history there, sure. Yeah, but absolutely. like, and you've already hinted at this before, like, or at least how I tell my students is like, there's some questions that are empirical questions, right? They're, they're questions that we can answer that should be based off data, right? It's not a moral based question. And if mm-hmm. you're talking about like morals or like meaning in life, that's a, those are questions science can never answer, right? Like very Popperian, right? Like that, that's just not an empirical problem that you right. can live your life, as you said, in both bins, right? You can have faith that the greater power is perhaps a deity, a god, a goddess, and also believe that we live in a world where there are like, where we know things, right? We know that smoking causes cancer, right? Like that's not a religious question. That's that's an empirical question, right? Mm-hmm. That this is an effective or ineffective way to reduce prejudice. That's not like a let me quote scripture question. That's a let's measure attitudes. Let's do an intervention. Let's answer that. And so mm-hmm. how I interpreted Palmer's character was that he, he was trying to communicate that, right? It's like, we're all going to have faith in something. There's a lot we don't know, right? There's, and he, I think there's a quote from him. Um, I can't, I'm not going to look at the time stuff for the exact quote, but like the quote is, he's like, there's just some questions where we don't know the answer why. And that's okay yeah. not to know why. Sure. And her, Ellie being like the representation of like this kind of pure version of science. It's like, she didn't accept that. She's like, no, every question has to have an answer to why. And I, I and I think I kind of agree with like that Palmer viewpoint. It's just like, there are some questions that are not empirical questions. That there will never be the the world is the way it is. Sure, I I, like, I I I certainly agree with I certainly agree with that. Yeah, and I think maybe that's like why I'm trying to think of like him in more of a negative light with confirmation bias because I really <laughs> felt like he was almost like the voice of like Carl Sagan of saying like these things can coexist. Just be intellectually humble. Some things we will never know. Sure, but like, you know the couple can get the religious person and the scientists can get together at the end type of deal. So I, I don't know. I felt like that, I, that I was like his that. true voice was I like, like from the, the Palmer viewpoint. But I like, like listening to you, I'm like, Palmer was a jerk. Oh, my God. Like, <laughs> what is he doing? And I was like, I, I need to rewatch the movie. Maybe the maybe, maybe my view uh, of it is is colored. But yeah, I'm I am wary of the the I'm wary of the argument that religious folks often make i i won't i i'm trying to avoid generalities here uh an argument that i that i see from religiously oriented people often which is this you know well you know we're, we're, we're never really gonna find the answer when that's just kind of coded as good luck with your science uh good luck with your you know your 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 um science fair project 
and we'll 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 see the truth. We'll we'll know the truth when we die. And so I'm a, I'm a, I'm wary of people attempting to fill this space between science and faith. Not that I disagree with the sentiment, but of course, lots of people say things for n- a number of reasons. And I just think that the way that um, Palmer uh, is kind of on the fence here is maybe I'm reading maybe I'm reading too too far into this and I like I said my perception is colored but maybe um he's got um a different kind of agenda and I think the funding scene is part of the way that I view this where they're having an argument about faith and they both have to face their own psychologies afterward right Ellie comes around a lot faster than I think most people would, but she still has cognitive dissonance. And I think with the recent decisions in the United States regarding faith and science, I'm at I'm at a, a sort of a, a a a point where I'm just like, well, what are we doing? We're kind of just spinning our wheels, and we're we're gonna figure out who is gonna break first. And it seems like science is breaking first. When it comes down to it. And that doesn't leave me with a really good feeling. And and perhaps that is how I'm viewing Palmer right now is is the 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 voice of reason is let's just be let's all be civil. And um, this is the correct way of doing things. And you were raised in a, a, a Christian household and, and you should know what scripture says. And, and we should all follow this 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 moral philosophy. And this is the only moral philosophy that is is good. Uh, and again, good luck with your science fair project. As I was listening to you, I. I think it makes complete sense, right? Because like you said, you, you don't want to time this video too much, but like really what is on the news, right? What we are getting updates on with the Supreme Court in Alabama, me particularly coming from Alabama, um, I have loved ones who are in, you know, same sex relationships who are actively, who actively want to have children, right? Who are looking into yeah. IVF, right? So like mm-hmm. when I hear this news, right, for anyone who's like, who's, you know, listening, he's like, wait, what is Jacob saying? It's if you were to ask me what the is going on in Alabama and the religious background, it infuriates me, right? Like it pisses me off. It gets me angry because it's like, this is not like religion seems to be like actively harming people. There's like no, it, it, it seems like unjustified harm. And it's like, it, it, it's, it can almost make you feel like this almost, or at least for me, how I've been thinking about this, it's like almost a little bit bitter in that moment of like, these people who are holding these religious views are actively hurting the people I love. And so mm-hmm. like, it, it's like, oh, Right, it, it can be easy to dismiss people who have religious viewpoints, um, or at least for me. Maybe this is me just talking about my own psyche of like sometimes like it's very like frustrating, like stressful, trying to be like understanding and trying to like be that middle voice. I, I do think that my background, like teaching in Alabama for like undergrad populations, it's that it is like ninety percent white students. It's Alabama. It's a very religious um, student body. You know, I, I think there it's. In the student body's like over 50%, I think Republicans are from the psych pool. Like it, it's it working with those types of students, I recognize that a lot of them and, and as they talked about their family, right? Because their families also come from religious backgrounds. Me trying to teach like a science class, me trying to teach about psychology, me trying to teach about like statistics and methods and etc. It forced me to talk to them in a way where like they would be very vocal and saying, it's not that we don't believe in science, right? Even though there are national trends on like this anti-intellectualism and like growing distrust sites, it, it seems like more of their nuance. It's that, like we're having a harder time trusting the scientist rather than the scientific process. Mm-hmm. Um, and like they often communicate that like a lot of their teachers are hostile towards them without like giving them room, like a safe space to like have a dialogue in class, right? Because if they bring up like God in a discussion section, like professors actively shut them down mm-hmm. and. I, I don't know, like those conversations with my students, I try to be as as far as like a teacher, like never shutting someone down if the reason for believing in something is faith related. At the same time, though, when it is an empirical issue, when mm-hmm. it is something that can be answered by the data, 
right? I, I will never tell them that they're wrong, but it's like, you believe this, but here's what's going to help. Here's what we know, or we can count, or we can measure, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know if that fine line is, I'm not telling them that they're wrong, but I try to make the most persuasive empirical case and saying, you, if you believe this, you're going against what this trend says. And here are the consequences uh, it, of that, if, if that absolute, makes sense. Yeah. So like, no, that, that is why, absolutely like, right. I'm and trying that not to is... damn Palmer. Like, I'm trying to give him that grace of like, maybe he is good faith. <laughs> and like, you're listening to this and like, what's going on in the world? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, um, so the way that you're phrasing that is, is um, very magnanimous. But it is it is absolutely a one way street. And that's what I'm trying to describe with Palmer here. Right. So he represents the voice of reason in the movie. And that's fine. Maybe he is the um, embodiment of Carl Sagan because Carl Sagan is not as good as actor as or as good looking as uh, Matthew McConaughey. It's fine. But remember, there is a default and that default is religious. And then science is the one that's going, well, wait a minute. And then we have to uh, contend with making sure that we are not shutting down people based on their faith. But at the same time, science and scientists have to make concessions. And that's that's my that's my problem with his character is that um, he's trying to convince Ellie that have a little faith, find your God again, because you can find answers in science, but you'll never find all of the answers in science. My buddy Jesus over here, he can help you out with that a little bit. (laughs) And that's the thing, right? We don't ever get to go, so I know that you're religious, and I understand that you believe in God, but hold on, I've got a telescope over here. Would you like to take a look at the surface of the moon? Right. Uh, and and uh, uh, like bask in its 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 awesomeness. Right. Because we can we can see that we figured out that we can change the shape of glass and make things bigger. Right. And, and or 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 vaccines like we have figured out a way. To use DNA against viruses to the betterment of mankind and it's you know that's it's, that's a bridge too far so science is always in persuasive mode just like you said but we we, we really don't get the other side of it and that's that's my problem with palmer and, and i i think no, i'll yeah. well, i think i'll i'll leave that one there so we so that's confirmation bias and of course other characters do have confirmation bias throughout the um f- throughout the movie any 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 other ones stick out to you probably the national security advisor just yeah. every time there was any signal or interaction with the scientists everything was a national threat this is <laughs> or everything was a, military you know, minds right if, yeah if it's the aliens the trojan horse or like why are we why are scientists globally working with one another this is an american pro- or something is like this is an american property we need to like patent this or something like that i was like what, what what's going on here? like everything was interpreted through that lens and i was like <laughs> there's okay, a that's frustrating. there's a good meme that goes around and i i saw it like either this week or last week and it's a picture of the globe <laughs> with only the united states on it and uh, the caption is the world according to the according to americans Oh yeah, definitely. it's just blue everywhere else, right? It's just blue ocean everywhere else, and it's 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 the United States in North America, uh, and so Alaska is not connected to anything. <laughs> it's really good, the and yeah, and I saw was like outsiders look at the U.S. and it's like Texas, the middle of the United States, mm-hmm, California's mm-hmm. on the coast, and you have New York. And you're like that's all the U.S. is those three states: Texas, Cali, mm-hmm. New York. And I'm like, mm-hmm. no, yeah, that, that makes sense. So, I mean, I can understand why uh, that that guy has and and none of his none of his um, worries are ever founded. Right. Like, of course, this is a benevolent supernatural uh, set of entities or entity. Yeah, he definitely and, embodied like the second component of that of confirmation bias, right? Like that biased assimilation. It's mm-hmm. like it's, it wasn't even him actively seeking info. It was just any info presented. How that that was just his lens, right? That it was that assimilating of, not, of yeah, 
Yeah. This is CNN. On a on a high note here. So Jacob, what was your favorite what was your favorite scene from the movie? My favorite scene from the movie, uh I'm trying to think of like what stood out to me most. It would maybe I mean the one that stood out to me the most being iconic, it was just um when in the middle of the movie the signal has been found, right? It's starting to actually now go onto the news media. A lot of people are starting to like go outside the scientific base, right? And so like you have all these different groups of Americans. And so it's like this two to three minutes shot of like, it's going through like a choir folk. It's going through an Elvis impersonator, right? Like all these things. Um, It's going through like white supremacists. It's going through like, I'm not sure, like all these different backgrounds and like everyone taking in their own version of like what it means for aliens to be there. And then, like, in the background, it's, like, you know, more people are going to church than ever before. Um, more people are, like, just being involved. It, it almost reminded me of, like, that Area 51 meme that happened a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Do you remember, like, in Facebook, everyone's like, I'm going to raid Area 51? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know why that's saying. I mean, there's so many good ones. But, like, I don't know. The It, it makes me want to believe in, like, the the superordinate goals. Because, like, when, I, when I'm a cynic, sometimes I think about, like, the, that Robin Barron's cave, right? Where it's, like, if humanity had this greater goal, we would, like, all come together and we'll together and and that, that's my day of a tea, but like, I, I want to have that hope that like, if, if something big, something on a cosmic scale did occur, that we would see like the social event where like, everyone's like just coming together and the weirdest people the the haters that this, it's just like, but mm-hmm. I don't know, something that can like bind humanity together. And yeah. I think like, with your thing with like this recency bias of like geopolitics in 2024, oh my God, like the world seems to be going to an awful, like it's, it's the just, exact like, it's the exact opposite yeah. of of you know uh, the Earth coming together as the United Earth government and forming the Federation with Vulcan and a few other planets, right? It feels like the exact opposite of that. Yeah. So I, I don't granted, know. Like granted, granted. Yeah. First contact day is still quite a ways off. It's about forty years from now, but I've fingers crossed. Uh, fingers crossed that we have first contact day, but no nuclear war in between. Yeah, no, that'd be great. That'd be yeah, actually that would be fantastic great. if you could promise me because that. Because Gene Roddenberry said, <laughs> Gene Roddenberry said that um, World War Three occurs in the 2020s. Oh no! Please don't tell me this at the end, uh, Alex. And the world, you're happy now. I was like <laughs> the world kumbaya together, and you're like, well. <laughs> speaking about global wars i'm like oh well that, that's right yeah that's the high note that's the high <laughs> note we're all, we're all laughing so we don't cry Laugh the pain. yeah <laughs> well i want to thank dr jacob miranda for joining me to discuss contact um, I love what you said, by the way, of uh, the superordinate goal from the Robbers Cave experiment in the 1950s and how the contact hypothesis isn't sufficient for reducing bias. Uh, so with, <laughs> with that in mind, um, before we say goodbye, Jacob, um, what would you like to plug? Where can people find your work, uh, find more about your work, the Mist Lab, all of that kind of stuff? Uh, I mean, I'm, I think I'm generally good on like plugging stuff. I mean, people can like look at my name. I think my website's like Jacob F. Miranda, but like other projects I do, if people are interested, you know, shoot me an email. That'd, that'd be good. But I, I really came on just cause like, this was, it was a fun experience. It was a fun assignment to like watch a movie, like, which are, like I said, typically a fun, rare fun assignment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's weird. I kind of, as a, like a good little student, cause all academics are just good little students. I'm like, this is my homework. <laughs> I'm going to watch it and take notes. But, I mean, all I have to say is, like, thank you for inviting me. It, it was Absolutely. a good time. Well, I want to thank you for joining me uh, to talk about Contact. That was a uh, great conversation. And I um, uh, hope to see you again. That's going to do it for this episode. Until the next one, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.